Autoimmune hepatitis is an inflammatory liver condition. This is actually driven by some mechanism of environmental stress plus genetic makeup. There's something about this interplay that then results in dysregulated inflammation in patient's liver. This inflammation can lead to fibrosis progression, ultimately cirrhosis, and actually can result in transplant and or death. So it's a really significant problem. The name for autoimmune hepatitis has been around since 1993. So it's actually quite an infant disease. It's been known about since probably the late 50s um, in an initial report by, by a guy named John Waldenstrom. Essentially though, the idea was this was maybe a result of some uh, viral condition that was burning out, but ultimately throughout the 50s and 60s, we started to learn that this was probably a separate entity. It underwent a, a number of different name changes, uh, but it kind of became codified as its own entity in the, in the early 90s. So the symptoms itself, besides the, the overt liver failure potentially, um, we're seeing a lot of chronic symptoms. It can be anything from no symptoms to severe symptoms of itch, fatigue, sleeplessness, medical anxiety and anxiety in general, and also a lot of mood disorders, we think. Um, so this is an invisible illness, and unfortunately, um, many providers and loved ones or caregivers don't fully understand the ramifications of the disease um, on the patient and the, the symptoms that they have. This is a female predominant disease. Primarily, it's, it's about 90% women, 10% men which unfortunately then the 10% of men that have the disease are left out in some regards and are very understudied as well, despite they are a rare part of a rare disease. We don't, but what we've actually seen, there are three, uh, three total uh, autoimmune liver diseases. One of them is called primary sclerosing cholangitis. That's actually a male predominant disease. So about 80% of those patients are male. And the other one, PBC or primary biliary cirrhosis, that is also a female predominant disease. Again, about 80 to 90 percent female. And then there's autoimmune hepatitis. There's been a lot of thought in PSC and PBC about these gender disparities. Unfortunately, we don't understand the genetics of it. But again, we still think it may be something genetic and inherent to the sex, but also maybe then the environmental risk factors. That this is not a communicable disease. Unfortunately, patients who have the word autoimmune hepatitis in their diagnosis codes get a lot of negative uh, looks from providers, ancillary staff, and even loved ones that they maybe could be communicable. But this is something that is a result of a hand that was dealt at birth, but also uh, unaware of certain environmental triggers that we fully don't understand. In fact, there are patients that really have minimal symptoms. They may present later in life with some routine medical screening. They have already progressed to cirrhosis. There are people in the teens that present very quickly with a lot of symptoms. So the complexity of this is that people present all over the spectrum. A very important phenomenon is autoimmune diseases in general. Autoimmune disease come in packs typically. So if some patient has abnormal liver tests, which would be the most common manifestation on routine screening, if the patient has other autoimmune diseases, you would really want to think about autoimmune hepatitis. Certainly though, if the common things that cause elevated liver tests, including drug or fatty liver disease, do not pan out, it's time to take that next step to either refer to a hepatologist or to start to look at the autoimmune profile, which includes four or five different uh, 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 labs that actually can characterize autoimmunity. These would be ANA, ASMA, anti-LKM, um, and anti-SLA. So this myriad of tests can sometimes frame this better. Certainly if we see positive results in this, this does sometimes necessitate a liver biopsy, that, but, but that may be best driven by the hepatologist. So given its rarity, you're right, you may find hepatologists that maybe have one or two autoimmune hepatitis patients. But at least with hepatology, most hepatologists are at large centers and transplant centers. So for instance, here at Indiana, we have over 300 autoimmune hepatitis patients that we've followed for the past 20 years. With that comes a lot of clinical experience. Um, certainly though, um, even local hepatologists that have only maybe treated one or two, may have a hard time, particularly when patients don't behave like they're supposed to, 
on immunosuppression. And in fact, most patients respond to immunosuppression. Unfortunately, there's about 15 to 20 percent of patients that will not. And these tend to be the most aggressive forms of disease. So early referral to a hepatologist in a transplant program is probably a very important piece.